And finally tonight, some domestic politics, a look at the intensifying clash between red and blue America. Few places reflect the growing political chasm in the U.S., as does the state of Wisconsin, and in particular, metropolitan Milwaukee, home to an engaged electorate and deep racial, social, and economic divisions. Gwen traveled there this past week. 50 years ago, we had that battle. Why are we fighting it again? Lifelong Milwaukee resident Earl Ingram lives on one side of the divide. Wisconsin has had a terrible history, uh, like many other states in this, in this country, of not being fair when it comes to people of color. Well, not just here, but across the nation with the conservative reality that has come back. Keith Best, who left the city for the suburbs in his 30s, lives on the other. I saw the jobs were leaving, I saw our taxes were going up, and I saw the school system was failing. And that's why I moved out to Waukesha. Best and Ingram are from essentially the same place, Battleground, Wisconsin. Minutes away from one another in distance, but miles away in their politics. In Milwaukee's River West neighborhood at an urban cafe named Coffee Makes You Black, the topic was how to curb neighborhood violence. 30 children have been shot in the city this year. It takes policies, it takes churches, it takes every single resource that we have, not out in Waukesha, not in Monopoly Falls, not in Mequon, right here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. By contrast, at Republican Congressman James Sensenbrenner's community town hall a few miles away, the hot topic was immigration. I believe there's not only a humanitarian crisis, but it is a national security crisis. The audiences, black and white, Democrats and Republicans, urban and suburban, reflect a sober truth. Residents of metropolitan Milwaukee, once home to ticket-splitting independent thinkers, no longer view the world through the same lens. The city of Milwaukee is majority minority, 56 percent black and Hispanic, but the minority population in the surrounding suburbs is somewhere into single digits. And here in southeastern Wisconsin, it goes way beyond race to social, economic, and partisan segregation. Milwaukee suburbs are redder than almost anywhere else outside the South. Craig Gilbert, who tracked Wisconsin's growing polarization in a four-part series for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, said the split widened in 2012. That's when an effort to recall Republican Governor Scott Walker drove record partisan turnout in the blue cities of Milwaukee and Madison, as well as in the red suburbs clustered around both. He's just so divisive. I mean, it's just all about how you feel about how he's governed the state over the past three or four years. And every piece of evidence we have is that it's almost um, right down the middle. Sure, yeah. One example, Republicans give Walker 91 percent approval rating. Among Democrats, President Obama gets 93 percent. All you have to do is look at a map and you can see in voting results just how widespread the differences are. And Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee, a deep, deep blue. You get the outlying areas of Waukesha County, and it can't get much redder. Milwaukee Mayor Thomas Barrett has slammed headlong into that partisan wall, running unsuccessfully for governor three times, the last time on the losing end of the effort to recall Walker. Polarization, he believes, has been driven by the strength of conservative talk radio. I think it's horrific economically um, wow. to have that much of a schism. I think it's bad in terms of race relations. I think it's bad in terms of, of growth for the region. Um, because I think if you've got an area that's pitted against each other, you're, you're not trying to find the similarities. You're not trying to find the commonalities that would allow you to work together as a team. And, and it's very unfortunate. The divide is deep and enduring. Carmen Murguia is a poet who was born on the city's south side. We don't talk to each other. We, we at least in, from what I've seen, um, we keep, our, keep ourselves separate because we don't think, A, we're going to be listened to on the side of the aisle and, um, or understood or um, even, even come to a happy medium. Sally Kabasinski also grew up in Milwaukee, but now lives in nearby Wauwatosa, Scott Walker's hometown. I don't understand liberalism because, you know, 
believe it or not, I was a Democrat. My family was a Democrat. And uh, what changed? Their liberalism. Republican Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish says Wisconsinites are merely voting with their feet. Wisconsin is really no different from the rest of the country. As population trends have evolved over time, so have political trends. And so folks are looking for candidates, leaders, representatives who speak to their wants and needs regardless of geography. Walker's move to roll back union protections for public workers, she said, actually helped. Did that leave the state divided? Because Democrats overwhelmingly wanted to recall the governor. Republicans overwhelmingly did not. You noticed that, too. I did notice that. <laughs> I think the whole country noticed yeah. that. I don't think it left the state divided. Frankly, I think it left the state in a stronger position than she was in even before. Try telling that to Keith Schmitz. He spent part of his weekend campaigning for Democrat Mary Burke, who's challenging Walker this fall. The thing about progress in any state is that uh, when you divide, you can't multiply, and, and things have been rather divisive in the states. As Walker's national star has continued to rise, Republicans are eyeing him as a likely presidential candidate in 2016. Governor Walker has sort of been making the argument to Republicans that you can be a very sort of staunch conservative and still succeed politically. Or survive anyway. Or survive anyway in a, in a battleground state, and we'll see if that happens. With 18 terms in Congress, Sensenbrenner has survived. You go fishing where the fish are, and the Republicans were turning the votes out in the suburbs while the Democrats were turning the votes out in the city. And no political party is going to turn votes out that will vote the other way. Five-term Democratic Congresswoman Gwen Moore says the lines have hardened over time as Republicans deny city residents funding for amenities like public transit. It's not like your ward captain walks up and down the street and says, you know, you, you need to stay in line and vote as a Democrat. But I think that when you don't have the opportunity, you know, like we're here in the public market, to gather and there be some sort of public forum for exchanging ideas that, that it is a lot easier uh, for people to corral you into, into one uh, type of thinking. Sheldon Wasserman, a former state assemblyman, describes himself as a moderate Democrat. He tripped into the political chasm in 2008 when he decided to expand his reach and run for state senate. The bigger district, which stretched across the divide, exposed him to a whole new world. I represented a district that was educated, um, progressive, um, and Republican, and Democratic, but more Republican. And I thought I knew what Republicans were all about. I thought I knew what Democrats were all about. He lost his race to the Republican incumbent by one point. In this environment, both sides admit there is little incentive to find middle ground. I don't know what it's going to take to, to get compromise again because it's, there's the, of the polarization. It's just a tough situation. One side is going to be proven right and one side is going to be proven wrong. I don't know how that's going to all end up. Is it a healthy fight? Good question. I, I can't answer that. <laughs> I wish I could. Good afternoon, Mr. Schickert. But with a gubernatorial and presidential race on the horizon, this fractured political landscape could determine outcomes for years in Wisconsin and in Washington. And back now with Mark Shields and David Brooks. Mark, how typical is this divide that